Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, first session of the afternoon. I hope you've had a good time networking away out there in this uh, revolutionary new uh, way that's been devised for you. Um, what we have in the next 45 minutes is what it says here, a, gl a global update on forests and climate change. I'm, I'm Richard Black. I'm, I'm actually a BBC journalist uh, by day, but I'm not here as a journalist. Just try to here to keep our four panellists in order for the next 45 minutes uh, or so. And these really are going to be updates. We've asked our panellists to be, to be brief as they can and to give you a, a, a quick snapshot of what's going on in their area so that you have time to ask them questions and put points to them afterwards. Um, we're going to be hearing from uh, Tony Lavinia right from the heart of the Red Plus negotiations. We're going to be hearing from Odiga Odiga on the latest on the gov Governor's Climate and uh, Forest Task Force and from Rachel Kite of the, uh, of the World Bank who's promised to bring some agriculture into this forest setup. But let me, without further ado, introduce uh, the first speaker, Caroline Spellman, who's Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in the UK. Caroline. Well, thank you very much, Roger, and good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to join others today in paying tribute to the work of the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Wangarai Matai, who sadly died recently. I was very struck by an article she wrote shortly before her death in which she said, governments must demonstrate a commitment to standing forests and the rehabilitation of degraded forests. And this can only be done if laws that encourage continued deforestation and forest degradation are reformed and if communities are supported to plant appropriate trees. If none of this happens, considerable financial re uh, resources will be invested without achieving reductions in poverty and other development gains. As the world can see in East Africa, there is no time to waste. And there is no time to waste. Global for forests are vitally important, and forests are crucial to the livelihoods of 1.2 billion of the world's poorest people, including 60 million indigenous people who depend on these forests for survival. They play an important role in preserving biological bio, uh, biodiversity, with 50 to 80 percent of terrestrial biodiversity located in them. And deforestation is responsible for 17 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. So quite right we should be debating this in the context of COP17. Forests are not only a source of greenhouse gas emissions, but also part of the solution. A of course they're a key issue within the climate change negotiations, but they're also important for biodiversity protection, food security, water, energy, and the ecosystem services that they provide. But globally, forests are under increasing pressure because of the demand for timber products and the conversion of forests into agricultural land for food production. These matters were analyzed in the UK government's rep foresight report on global food and farming futures, which was sponsored by my department jointly with the Department for International Development, led by someone I'm sure known to you, Professor Sir John Beddington. That report looked at how we can feed a growing global population. And John always uses this statistic, which I think is so powerful, that there will be a billion more people in the world in 14 years' time. That really does focus the mind. It identified the big challenges and choices we face in seeking to balance competing pressures on the global food system. The report called for an integrated approach to food security, with emphasis on promoting a more sustainable approach to agriculture. The International Commission on Sustainable Agriculture and Climate Change has recently made similar recommendations. We need to raise agricultural yields, but we need to raise them through improved productivity rather than through using more land or water. 70% of the water in use is currently for agriculture, and the demand for food is forecast to increase by 50% by 2050. We also need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the negative effects which agriculture can have on our environment. In essence, we need that climate-smart agriculture we're talking about, about now. This approach offers a route to a green, low-carbon, low carbon resource efficient economy while increasing food production that's fundamental to poverty alleviation, economic growth and environmental sustainability. 
Climate smart agriculture is not a panacea, but it can help us address adaptation, mitigation and food security. Agriculture will have to adapt to increasingly variable and unpredictable growing conditions, including the increased incidence of floods and droughts, increased temperatures and different patterns of weeds and pests and diseases. Another important part of this equation is access to water. Current estimates suggest that just over a billion people live in river basins facing physical water scarcity and a recent analysis suggests that three quarters of the global population is exposed to the threat of water insecurity. I've already mentioned global agriculture uses more than 70% of all water withdrawals but recent examples of the impact of that are too little water in the Horn of Africa or too much water on the impact of the floods in Pakistan last year. To national level, integrated water resource management is essential to deal with these competing demands. Now all of these issues, forests, water, food security, sustainable land management and biodiversity are linked. It's therefore essential that we adopt an approach that takes proper account of their relationships between them. This highlights the importance of the natural capital of our forests. The value we place on forests is much greater than the value of the timber products they provide. Forests offer so much more fuel, food, medicines, soil fertility, water cycle management, cultural and spiritual values. However, as long as they remain undervalued, forests will continue to be damaged and potential economic opportunities lost forever unless we can recognise their true value. International forestry is a high priority for my department and for the UK government. That's why I'm here today. The UK, through its International Climate Fund, has committed £2.9 billion sterling to enable the UK to help developing countries both adapt to the impacts of climate change and move on to a low carbon growth path. Of this £2.9 billion, £600 million is aimed at tackling deforestation, forest degradation and the drivers of deforestation. The fund is jointly run by ministers from three government departments working together, Department of Energy and Climate Change, the Department for International Development and my own. Together we've agreed that under the fund we will be investing in Red Plus and forest governance to deliver climate change, biodiversity and poverty alleviation. This joined up policy making is extremely important and ensures that we're able to achieve multiple benefits through our international forestry funding. Taking a joined up approach also means that we get the maximum value for the resources invested. As part of the International Climate Fund, the three departments are developing a forests and climate change programme. We'll be working closely with forest nation partners, donor countries and the private sector and other stakeholders to ensure the portfolio delivers results against our three main objectives, carbon abatement, biodiversity protection and poverty reduction. More particularly, my department is working now closely with the Brazilian government to develop a joint project in the Cerrado. That's a section of dryland forest right adjacent to the Amazon, but less well known. And I'm very pleased to announce that my department is going to fund a £10 million project in the Cerrado. Home to 5% of the planet's biodiversity, and in fact 30% of Brazil's biodiversity, the Cerrado is considered to be one of the most biodiverse savannas in the world. Yet deforestation is intense, driven by agriculture and forest fires. By 2009, the biome had already lost about 48% of its forest cover. This project will reduce rates of deforestation by supporting the registration of land ownership under the Rural Environment Register to ensure compliance with the Brazilian Forest Code. It will provide technical assistance to help farmers with the restoration of vegetation on illegally cleared land. And it will support measures to prevent and deal with forest fires, a major driver of deforestation. The UK is complementing its work on deforestation and the drivers of deforestation with an expanded programme of support for forest governance in forest nations. It's essential that land tenure is clarified and regulatory legislation put in place and enforced to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in a credible and sustainable way. 
The UK's forest governance, markets and climate programme combines demand-side measures to change behaviour in consumer countries with supply-side actions to strengthen governance, capacity and legality systems in producer countries, including a number of African countries. Durban needs to follow up on the Cancun Red Plus Agreement, which sets the framework for country-level efforts. We need to make progress on the methodological guidance on how to implement Red Plus, covering reference levels, environmental and social safeguards, and monitoring and reporting. This morning I spoke in a session organised by the Convention of Bio Biological Diversity, where I stressed the importance of promoting the synergies between biodiversity and climate change objectives, particularly through biodiversity safeguards in Red Plus, as well as ecosystem-based approaches to adaptation. We need to seize these opportunities for the multiple benefits from Red Plus and to avoid its potential adverse impacts by helping implement the safeguards agreed in Cancun. Finally, and perhaps most critically, progress needs to be made on the financing of Red Plus. This will require the Green Climate Fund to include finance for Red Plus, the use of all available sources of climate financing, both public and private, synergies with non-climate funding, including payment for ecosystem services, and delivering the results for local people and ecosystems as well as the global climate system. It's also clear that Red Plus requires not only investment in forests, but also investments to tackle the drivers of deforestation. In particular, we need to invest in environmental, sustainable agriculture. We also need to establish a UNFCCC work program on agriculture that is able to consider both climate adaptation and mitigation. This will enable parties to address these matters properly within the terms of the Convention. But while UNFCCC attention to forests and agriculture is essential, it's not the only forum that matters. Rio Plus 20 next year provides an excellent opportunity to complement work in the multilateral conventions and to catalyse new initiatives with governments, the private sector and wider civil society for sustainable development in forests and agricultural land use. I'm realistic about what can be achieved through these international processes. I don't subscribe to the view that it's all too difficult. These issues matter to people's livelihoods and future prosperity. We need to summon political will to overcome them. We have a real opportunity to make progress through Durban to Rio and on to Hyderabad. Moving to a low carbon economy, producing more food sustainably, dealing with environmental degradation, providing access to clean energy and poverty eradication are all part of the same picture. We simply won't be able to tackle these issues successfully if we try to deal with the various problems in isolation. Finally, let me bring us right back to Evangari Matai, who I quoted at the beginning of my speech, because this is the International Year of Forests, and we are here in Africa to address how to protect forests globally. As she said, governments must demonstrate a commitment to standing forests and the rehabilitation of degraded forests. Red Plus is not only about the total area of forest cover, but also about protecting natural forests that are carbon rich, climate resilient, and provide the vital ecosystem services on which so many people depend. And Red Plus is not only about forests, but also about tackling the drivers of deforestation through sustainable land management and sustainable agriculture, supported by improved land tenure and forest governance. We face a huge global challenge on climate change, poverty and biodiversity, especially at a time of economic austerity. We need to make every effort to count by seeking multiple benefits, carbon, biodiversity and poverty reduction. I look forward to working closely with others on these issues here in Durban and also in the run-up to Rio Plus 20 next year. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Caroline Sparman. Um, as she was mentioning, there are very obvious issues where agriculture and forests interact for good or evil. And that's the thing that's going to, thing that's going to be picked up by our next speaker, uh, speaker Rachel Kite, who's um, in charge of sustainability at the World Bank, which means both environment and sustainable agriculture. Rachel. Thank you, Richard. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, 
Yesterday I promised, uh, I'm sure some of you were there, um, those gathered for Agriculture Day, that I would bring the outcomes and the results of their conversation uh, into Forest Day. Um, it was a very upbeat meeting, I thought, uh, led uh, by the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries for South Africa, Tina Jumper peterson who even called on God and whiskey to help us find a way to bring agriculture into climate negotiations. I don't know how much whiskey you've got here, but obviously you, you guys have had a lot of success over the years with red, and so um, we, thought we'd, uh, we thought we needed a little bit of help too. There was real steel and focus in the way in which she uh, presented the challenge to an audience of about 500, 600 researchers, farmers, development practitioners, civil society groups, policy makers. And by the end of the day, she got what she asked for and what the South African government very much wanted, which was a strong and an unequivocal call for action on climate smart agriculture. She is now going to deliver a letter to the negotiators asking them to approve, at a minimum, uh, a decision to set up a work programme on agriculture under Substa. The letter poses an ultimatum of sorts. Um, I think you have experience in the forest world of ultimatums. Without a work programme for agriculture, there shouldn't be a deal. The simple sounding request is the culmination of years, of years of thinking, solid research, a mounting sense of urgency that something needs to be done, and fast to transform agriculture into a more productive, sustainable and resilient system. Currently, greenhouse gases from agriculture account for roughly 14% of global emissions. We have no other choice if we are to rise to the challenge of feeding 9 billion people by 2050 without destroying the planet of doing something. The horizon seems distant, but the crisis in agriculture is felt on several counts today. More frequent and extreme weather events are already affecting the food supply, infrastructure and livelihoods. You only have to think about the cycle of drought and forest fires in Russia last year, the tragedy unfolding this year in the Horn of Africa, to appreciate the challenges facing our food system. Agriculture and Rural Development Day was a showcase of proven solutions and innovation that address those challenges. Throughout the day, I was impressed by the powerful evidence of climate smart agriculture delivering food and incomes, adapting to existing climate variability, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions as they were presented. Participants concluded that there is much to be done to scale up these examples in order to transfer food and farming systems. In agriculture, just as in forests, we face the challenge of speed and scale. The day ended on another high note, picking up very much from where the minister left off. Paolo Prostagio from Brazil offered to host the next Agriculture and Rural Development Day at Rio Plus 20. I hope you would agree that that's another excellent opportunity to fuse the agendas together. And I think that from my perspective, respecting the proud history of Forest Days and all of the effort that many have put into developing this, but also now looking at the momentum uh, developing in the agriculture sector. sector. As we look at one landscape, Rio plus 20 really would be the place where we could try to find a way to discuss these items in tandem. So why was I asked to talk about agriculture at Forest Day? Well, because as you know, the fate of forests and agriculture are bound together. They're bound together just as food security, poverty reduction and climate change can't be addressed in isolation. So forests and mosaic landscapes, climate change mitigation adaptation goals will not be reached without good, sustainable development. Forests cannot be sustained if people are hungry or the governance of natural resources is inadequate. Issues of poverty, food security and access to energy are inextricably linked and should be an integral part of how we respond to climate change. When I talk to our clients, countries that are borrowing or seeking our knowledge, they ask for our deep sectoral expertise in agriculture, in energy, in water, in, in forestry. But they're also asking us to help them think through the nexus of those issues and also asking us to help them build systems whereby they can analyse the nexus at the same time. Hunger places a direct burden on forests when people are forced to push deeper into forested areas to grow crops. 
Hunger and poverty take a toll when people resort to making and selling charcoal faster than the natural rate of forestry regeneration in order to buy food. You can try to ring face forests or try to ban cut charcoal, but unless and until access to land, crop productivity, energy affordability and extreme poverty are addressed, our best efforts will be in vain. We have to propose viable, integrated solutions that work for people on the ground. Unless they benefit from the protection of watersheds or increased crop yields or have higher income or can live with greater climate resilience, the best laid carbon plans will fail. This morning, Francis Seymour, Tony Simons and myself had the pleasure of launching a new research programme on forest trees and agroforestry. This consultative group and agricultural research programme is a collaborative effort from a group of leading research institutions, C4, the World Agroforestry Centre, Biodiversity, Biodiversity and the International Centre for Tropical Agriculture. It should help countries and development partners expand their focus from dense canopy tropical forests to mixed agricultural forest landscapes or mosaic landscapes where people and trees come into greater contact. Those landscapes, as you heard this morning, are under huge pressure, growing population, energy demand, soil erosion, nutrient depleting agricultural practices and increasingly climate change. At the same time, forests and trees in Africa's drylands and other parts of the world are crucial safety nets for people struggling to avert famine in times of economic and climatic stress. The value of that safety net is immense. It would be terrible to watch it disappear only to realise the true value of the ecosystem in which we live. In fact, in 2011, we can't really claim ignorance. There's been excellent work done by UNEP, by us and others, to put a price tag on ecosystem services. The price is basically infinite. We know forests and trees on farms are an integral part of the landscape systems that support us all, and we need to find ways to value them. The good news is that there's more and more willingness to focus on adaptation, livelihoods, food security and dry forests. The agenda of Forest Day today attests to that and also attests to the greater awareness of the integrated solutions that are out there. It's what we call the triple win. Mitigating climate change by building resilience in farming and forest systems while increasing yields and income. Farmers already understand that growing trees on farms can help fatten their livestock break the impact of harsh winds and improve soil conditions. Within a few years, those trees can provide wood fuel for domestic use or for sale. Our job is to support policies, nationally and internationally, that encourage those kinds of practices based on best science and common sense. So, in my conclusion, bringing yesterday to today, I would urge you, the experts, and you, those who advise policymakers, to keep the needs of local people first and foremost in your minds and in global plans. Mitigation and adaptation initiatives, particularly in forest and agriculture, only succeed if they are pro-poor. If we shore up sustainable access to natural resources and improve livelihoods, we can lessen the toll of short-sighted degradation, pollution and deforestation. We act now, and if we act decisively, we can perhaps reverse the vicious cycles and start investing in landscape restoration and poverty reduction programs that deliver that triple win. Adaptation-based mitigation is the solution to a landscape in which we can all live sustainably. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Rachel. Well, probably like me, a lot of you spend time at these conferences looking at doors where people are talking and you wonder what's going on. And there are so many of these doors that often you can't really get a good handle on exactly what is going on in all of these processes at the same time. Well, we're about to be enlightened on one of the most important here. Let me introduce our next speaker, Tony Lavinia, who's uh, Dean of the Ateneo School of Government in uh, Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. He led the uh, Lulu CF negotiations all the way back in Kyoto, and now he's facilitating the Red Plus negotiations uh, in the LCA track, and he's going to tell us the latest. Thank you again to the organizers for inviting me. This is the third uh, year in a row that I've been asked to update the participants of Forest Day 
on the state of the negotiations. Um, thank you especially to my friend Francis Seymour, the uh, Director General of C4, who has trusted me to do this. Um, in the first, I've always been nervous doing this, and in the first uh, uh, year I did this, I wrote everything uh, in, in, in a paper and my computer and, and read it uh, verbatim so that I won't make a mistake. In the second year, last year, in, this was in Copenhagen, last year in, in Cancun, I was a bit more confident, so I still wrote it down this time in my iPad, but decided I won't read it and just, uh, you know, go with the flow. Anyway, my iPad failed me there, so I had to really go with the flow, but it was still written all down, I could do it. This time I just did bullets because I feel more confident, uh, having not made a mistake in the last two years in talking about the negotiations. And for that, I also thank my fellow negotiators who are all here have sort of trusted me when I say publicly uh, what's happening in, in the negotiations. Uh, we do have among negotiators a certain uh, ethic of confidentiality that that's important to be able to trust each other as we express our national interest in, in these uh, negotiations. At the same time, I do belong to the new breed of negotiators that believe in full transparency. Uh, and participation of stakeholders in this uh, negotiation. So I even try to risk sometimes and tweet and Facebook a lot about the negotiations. In any case, I think to understand where we are now with, with, with Red Plus, my main responsibility is on Red Plus Finance, but I suppose I can also update you on, on the Substa decision which was adopted uh, last night because to understand what's going to happen in the next week on Red Plus Finance, you need to understand the Substa decision that was adopted uh, yesterday with great difficulty and drama I mean, all, all the way down to the last minute, down to the last few um, minutes that were given to us in these negotiations. Um, to understand this, you have to understand the three pillars of, of Red Plus you know, in, in the negotiations, in, in the whole climate uh, UNFCC context, but I think it also reflects what's in the real world. The first is that for Red Plus to work, you have to have an MRV system national reference levels, a good technical basis for actually assessing uh, national performance on emissions with respect to forest. That, that's one. Second, a robust system of safeguards and also informing each other of how we are respecting those safeguards. That's very important because that reminds us that forests, to, forests have multiple functions, forests produce and provide multiple ecosystem services, and it is to our peril if we reduce it or commodify it to carbon. That's very important. And that's why those two tracks have always gone together with the third track, which is one of finance. Because all of this, the safeguards have to be financed, the implementation have to be financed, the setting up of the MRV system have to be financed. And ultimately, when you do avoid emissions, at the same time producing core benefits, that has to be paid for. Because that's the whole point of all of this, right? Whether you call it compensation or positive incentives, the thing is that at the end of the road, you have to finance the last phase, the resource-based uh, phase of, of Red Plus. So the negotiations have always been tracking these three areas. Uh, and in Copenhagen, uh, as I predicted then, uh, we were able to reach agreement essentially on how to deal with the first two. It wasn't adopted because of the failure to adopt anything in Copenhagen, but that same agreement was essentially adopted in Cancun, except for the finance part, the third track, the third pillar, uh, that was postponed because there was a difficulty in Cancun for us to have any real meeting time, the negotiators, to thresh out the various issues around, around finance. So that was left with LCA, but safeguards, and in this case, the safeguards were agreed uh, in respect for indigenous peoples, respect for stakeholders, environmental integrity, uh, uh, transparency and effectiveness in governance. Uh, all of that was uh, approved in, uh, in Cancun. But in Cancun, it was also decided that we needed to enforce this in some way. This is, of course, enforced nationally, but at the international level, we need to have some kind of sharing of information. So the provision, the creation of an information system so that countries actually know how they're implementing the safeguards. And what that system will be would be decided in the next COP, which is here. And essentially, in, in, in Substa yesterday, uh, it was adopted the first guidance. I call it the first guidance because if you look at the decision, it says that 
Uh, this, is the, in, this is the guidance that we have for developing the system of information on safeguards. But in the next session of SABSTA, we will consider the need for additional guidance. And if such guidance is needed, then we will uh, consider such guidance, and then that should be given to the COP, to the next COP for, for approval. There's been some criticism of that, and I understand that. I mean, I, I would have preferred a much more detailed guidance at the outset. I mean, I actually started that way. But as a, as a safeguards advocate myself, when I started looking at the content, the possible content, and making it more detailed, I, I realized that we are flying blind into this. You know what I mean? Uh, that there's very little experience of safeguards in, in, in the world that's directly related to REM. And it's actually better if you have that experience first before we detail that guidance. So I actually welcome this space for a year, maybe, maybe even more. And in fact, I'm, I probably prefer more so that there's real experience on the ground so we know what kind of information really is needed to enforce the safeguards. I really don't care about the bureaucracy about all of this. I mean, I, I think, yeah, me, Kateri was talking, I saw in a C4 tweet that you know, that we're, 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 bare, uh, we're drowning, you know, the, the implementation in a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of forms, a lot of bureaucracy, and, and that, that's really wrong. You know, I think you can report on safeguards on a single page, but the right page, right, the right questions have to be asked. And I don't think we are there yet in asking the right questions. So I welcome this decision of Substa, which actually says we will review what we have on the basis of consistency, comprehensiveness, effectiveness, um, and there's one more word I forget, transparency, uh, in the way the information around safeguards is provided. So the work is cut out for us in the next uh, year to, to, to do that, but this is all in the spirit of advancing implementation. The real breakthrough, I think, as well in the SABSA decision is the decision on reference levels, which brings us closer now to developing the MRV system that's needed for Red Plus to, to work. I mean, uh, for a while there, yesterday uh, afternoon, we actually thought uh, that there would be no agreement, simply because it's so technical, there's so many things to be dealt with, a, a made very big political issue around adjustment according to national circumstances, which some of us are you know, concerned about, can, 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 have, can, can have impacts on environmental integrity. But we were, I think, all able to sort it out, and I feel quite happy with with, with the results, I mean, uh, at least it gives countries guidance, in fact, on how they will now construct reference levels. The more important, the important thing from an environmental integrity is that countries agree that that will be assessed, that their, that their um, offer of what their forest reference levels or forest emission levels will be, uh, will, will, will be assessed by, by will, will, will undergo an assessment process, and, and I think that's the, that's the welcome thing. With these two sort of pillars uh, progressing this well, we now have the third pillar next week, which I am responsible for on LCA Red Plus Finance. I mean, the, the self-interest in me when I was watching the, the, you know, the masterful, I call it the masterful uh, chairing of uh, Peter Graham of Canada and my colleague from the Philippines, Vicky Tauli Corpus, as they brought the Substa decision to a closure, when, for a moment when it seemed like they were not going to arrive at the decision, I said, well, that means I don't have to work next week because although there is no link between finance and safeguards and, you know, and I mean, there's no negotiating link, the reality is that we've always seen this as needing to progress together. And in fact, it was in a way an, an, an anomaly that finance did not progress uh, while the other two areas progressed. I mean, it was a... Anom anomalous in the context of the Cancun negotiation, because of the Cancun negotiation, the dynamics of the Cancun negotiations, which we don't have now. I think parties here uh, don't, you know, there's a lot of openness, a lot of uh, 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 willingness to undergo a really consultative and participatory process among the parties. Uh, and so, but now with these two things in place, I think there's a good chance, and I, I feel confident that we will be able to arrive at an agreement in. Uh, in, in the next week on, on Red Plus Finance, or at least on our work program on Red Plus Finance for the third phase. The negotiations in, in, in the LCA is simply about the third phase, uh, and, and, and people forget that sometimes. It's not about all of finance on Red Plus, it's about financing results-based actions, the third phase of, of Red Plus. 
Uh, there's a problem to the extent that there's still a lot of issues around phase one and phase two and whether the main money is even available for, for phase two. And so, so that, that's a tricky thing because the mandate of my group is really just about the third phase. But how can you talk about the third phase if you have problems in the, phase, in the first two phases, right? So there's some opening there, but I don't know how, how, how wide that opening, opening would be. But the main focus will be on, on financing results-based action. Um, the truth is that that's a bit far away, and we actually have time to do this properly. So the goal is actually to arrive at a, at a, at a program of action, at a, at a work program, that could lead us to really constructing then the, what we call the modalities and the procedures for, for, for this last phase uh, of, of Red Plus. I mean, the, the provision of uh, incentives and, or the compensation, if you want to use the, that, that, the term. And, and um, for that, I had produced a one-page text uh, 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 for negotiation because we only have a few days of negotiation left. Uh, but it's potentially, uh, if most of it survive or if the parties are even in plot as I expect them to improve it, I think it could be a text that could move uh, this process forward. For the first time, first of all, like, like everything else, the text reminds us of this link, again, between safeguards, MRV, and finance. So that, that's important. It reminds us that forest has multiple functions, multiple provides multiple ecosystem service. That's, that's really, if, when you look at the preambular parts and paragraph one, you know, that's what it says, essentially. Uh, and that my intent when I drafted that as chairman was to, to, to be sure that when we construct this system, uh, which is carb might be carbon-based, it is done knowing what the context is and knowing that in the real world, the carbon ecosystem service cannot be separated from the other ecosystem services and all have to be paid for together with it. And it's very important to remind ourselves of that. Uh, and then for the first time, the text actually mentions potential sources for the third phase. Uh, the usual, public, uh, bilateral, multilateral, private, uh, sources for finance, market-based mechanisms, and a very innovative idea coming from one party of an integrated adaptation mitigation mechanism that could be used. I mean, so I'm actually quite excited with the possibility of discussing these different mechanisms. Um, just as a, you know, as a listing, for purposes then of doing the work to identify what the implications are for this mechanism, because that's important, particularly for the new ones. I, I, I prefer to stay away from the GCF and the usual multilateral, bilateral thing, because we, we sort of know that, and uh, there's, that's being discussed in the finance group of the climate change. But I would really like to discuss these new ideas, the, the role of the private sector, the market-based mechanisms, this new idea of a, of a, of a combined uh, and joint uh, mechanism, uh, and then and what are the implications. So the text actually then calls for a work program around these options to, to look at its implications, to look at its relationships to, to safeguards, for example, and how it implements that. Uh, first to a technical paper by the, sub, by, the, by, by the secretariat, then an expert workshop in the next year, going to then the COP for decision, I mean, uh, if in fact a decision has to be, if a decision is necessary uh, uh, next year. Uh, so for this part of Red Plus, which is, well, for Red Plus itself, if we conclude this negotiation successfully, as we did with Substa, this actually brings Red Plus essentially from the political to the technical, from the political to implementation. Uh, in the real world, of course, as all of us who implement things also know the political always is there. But essentially, the bulk of it now is going to be in the field and in implementation. I think it's a welcome, welcome thing. That's a signal that many of you have been, 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 been waiting for. And it's good for the climate process that there's something like this is now on the way and it's now launched. Uh, but within sort of the red plus, and then this is my last point, the, within the red plus, uh, context, 
we do have a new agenda that will come about. I mean, so as Red Plus negotiators, we do not have to retire yet, although I might retire, but, <laughs> but we don't have to because there's the drivers of deforestation and there's the link to agriculture and to land use change and forestry. And that was postponed. I, 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 you know, I plead guilty for that, but it's from a, from a political negotiating point of view, uh, uh, it was just not possible to deal with that in the Copenhagen text and also in Cancun. Um, so, but, but that is now on the table because that was postponed for the next COP. Uh, uh, so the subsidization has something about drivers of deforestation. Um, and, 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 and the agreed thing there was that this is a broad discussion uh, that will happen next and, and it will be an agenda setting discussion. If there's an agriculture um, program uh, that's adopted, it could converge with that. Uh, but it also could go its own way because of its link to, to, to forest. So we'll see, and, and we'll see as well what, what happens in the agriculture uh, discussions. So in the end, uh, how do I feel about where we are now from a negotiating point of view? I actually feel, feel quite good. I mean, uh, not completely happy with the result of Substa, uh, but I think I, f I feel like we, the train is in going in the right uh, 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 direction, especially if we're now going to the, f the area of implementation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. Let me, without further ado, introduce our fourth uh, speaker, Mr. Odiga. Odiga, he is chairman of the Cross River State Forestry Commission in Nigeria, an area that's uh, hugely important for biodiversity, of course, as well as uh, for forest recipient of the 2003 Goldman Prize for Africa and the Red Plus coordinator in his state. And Mr. Odiga is going to give us all an update from the Governor's Climate and Forests Task Force. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Richard, for the introduction. Um, fellow panelists, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, Given the global updates on forests and um, climate change, is indeed it's a rare opportunity to be given this chance to do that. And I'm quite grateful to see uh, CIFO and the Forest Day Five for giving me this opportunity. Um, it essentially has to do with our determination to witness a transformational change from the threat we are facing from climate change. And I think every one of us is celebrating that transformation, the need for transformation, from transformation occasion by action. I take a cue from the woman we have been celebrating all morning. It is her action that moves us forward, and we are celebrating that. Standing before you, I am a product of her decision to take action because she aroused in me a Latin interest and passion sown by my grandfather on the need to take care of nature. This is what she did. I have been on with a campaign to protect the last tropical rainforest in Nigeria. Somehow in 2002, I was privileged to make a physical contact with this lady at WSSD in Joburg, here in South Africa, in a forum organized by Ed Charter, where she had the opportunity to make a presentation and show a short video like we saw today. And in that video, it demonstrated the power that we have to make change happen through action, using her Green Belt movement. Now, I ask myself, what do you do to make a difference in the world? I told myself, go do precisely the same thing. And her action aroused in me the environmentalism and then the need to become a tree planter. Not long thereafter, in 2003, 
just with that inspiration, I won the Goldman Environmental Prize for Africa. Now, this somebody who did something very distinct, something very unique that spurred me out. Why am I saying so? We have had plenty of words, different meetings. What is seriously lacking is the need for action. I thank C4 that the level we are today in terms of knowledge concerning the issue of forest and red is at the instance of C4. From forest day one to forest day five, people can attest to that that if you didn't come to Forest Day, you missed the car. So not only are people brought together with diverse background to interact and to see what action to take, but there's tons and tons of material and information and knowledge that is available that we all take home. And it's sufficiently giving us a good grounding on what these issues are. And that is concrete action that is motivating change. Now, that is at that level. I know that there are other changes in the level of UN red countries are taking action. Then you have FCPF. But what level I think we are doing something substantial E, that is touching where it matters most, is at the GCF level. This is the Governor's Climate and Forest Tax Force, where the government that is closer to the people at the grassroots, they are taking concrete action. Now, to date we have 16 states and provinces, their governors have come together and taken a decision 16 states from six con uh, 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 countries of America, Brazil, Indonesia, Peru, and Nigeria. They've come together, said, look, red is good. Red is something constructive. Yes, we all agree. But the thing that is lacking, how do we make change happen on ground? And these 16 state governors and province of, uh, of governors and of states and provinces are controlling forests, tropical high forests in, of 25, uh, 20%, and they're influencing it substantially. So if we do an audit of what is happening, constructive work is going on. I can speak very precisely like in Brazil, three of the five states are influencing national policy in Brazil on red program. You come to my country, Nigeria, from my state. My state led the way to Nigeria becoming a red state. That wasn't the case until the state government resolved that yes, rather than protect the forest or use the forest for timber concession, we are going to protect it for carbon concession. That is constructive. And so to now, that has given the nation the pride of becoming a red, ready nation. That is the action of a government at the grassroots. And has moved forward to make the ordinary people know that, yes, if there's a paradigm shift from using forests to just to get timber to managing forest for carbon concession, the article of trade has become carbon. Then those who live in, live on, survive on forests that would be used for carbon concession need to understand the whole trade around the article called carbon. They need to measure it. They need to know, just like they used to know before, that yes, in this tree, they, this is the volume of timber that can be extracted. They need to know this is the volume of carbon that our forest is able to, to muster and put out on sale. And this is the worth of that carbon. This is the price we are likely going to get. These are the benefits. So this is what GCF states are doing. This is what I can boast of precisely in my state, that the ordinary person, they are even no, the farmers themselves are able to find out, measure the carbon in the tree. 
It's what I would call demystification of science. Until we bring it down to their level, they are willing, they are ready, and they are able to comprehend this science and then use it to positively protect the resource that we are talking about and thereby mitigate the climate change crisis. So I think that there's quite some positive things that are going on there. But however, as we talk about progress, there's the need to look at some problems, challenges that we face. As I have given us the, so much of energy that we put into organizing COP and other meetings, so much of resources are put in there. But my question once in a while is this, how accountable are we? For instance, there's individual accountability. We've come in here, we get all the tons of knowledge that we can get from COP. When we go back, do we wait to come back the next COP again? Then we talk like this and go back. Now, how do we translate this knowledge that we have gotten from CIFO to our boss, to our colleagues, to our families? I imagine that if out of 1,200 of us, precisely 1,200, as the Americans would put it, 1,200 of us here, if we go back, each of us, haven't known the value the forest plays in our life and the need to extend the forest cover of the world so as to mitigate climate change and enjoy the bene as multiple benefits associated with forests. If we take action that, yes, before I come back to the next cup, I will plant a hundred trees. I think that all of us here, the 1,200 of us, could have together planted 120,000 trees. That could be something like 120 hectares of forest, which we can review back. Imagine that, and if we do that every year, imagine what that would, that is as individuals. And I tell you the power of individual action is very enormous. Let's leave the change we hope to see that we preach about. I did that, there's a young lady here, she came from, um, She's an American, she came through UK to do a postgraduate work. She met me while raising, three years back, while raising my own private nursery to plant trees because I caught that from Wangari. That yes, as you mobilize people to plant trees, if I don't have the capacity to mobilize people, I can leave the change I wish to see. I have my private nurseries that I raise indigenous trees to plant. That if we do that, if we give ourselves the tax of doing that, there will be the transformation. So the greatest need we need to do, problem is that we need to have to be individually accountable for the knowledge that we get from here, the things that we partake from, the contacts we make, to make sure that we transform the earth, extend the forest cover with that. Another challenge we really look at is that insufficient allocation of resources to make sure this transformational change happens. Imagine the preparations that we do, pre-COP and COP, and then also post-COP. There's a trick about post-COP, the activities that we carry out at the national level as generally. Rather than review and see how to implement what we have done here, we prepare for the next COP in our post-COP activities, rather than ensuring that have we been able to justify the knowledge we gain from COP. So there's a need to commit. Imagine the volume of preparation at different national level and at international level, global level. Let's aggregate that amount of money. If we put only 10% of that total amount put in preparation, into concrete activities on the ground, I bet you there will be more meaningful impact. Another issue of concern we need to look around is this, as we talk about forest, forest is not here, time well exceptional, I can see a lot of forest in Durban, but places like London, places like Washington, places like Abuja, that's not where the forest is that we're talking about. The forest is right there in Ekuri people. And as we sit here to decide and talk 
about forests. There is a man with an axe and a power chainsaw who is poor, who is hungry, whom I talk to. Please don't cut down the forest. This is how he's helping you. He tells me, yes, Odiga, you're right. But don't forget, a hung, an empty sack cannot stand erect. You can't confront that man to let him leave the forest alone. When his wife is about putting to bed, she is between death and life. You're asking him to leave the forest alone, but the logger is tapping him by the side. You need $200 to take your wife to the hospital. Here you have $200 to let go those trees there. What would that man do? To leave the trees or to leave the $200? I bet you he's a wise man. He prefers, he loves his wife. He will take the $200 and let the trees go so that he will protect the wife's life. So these are the realities that we face daily. That if we're able to make these things happen on ground, we're most likely to succeed in protecting our forest. We have prospects in protecting the forest, in allowing the forest to stay for all of us. There are a lot of prospects. I bet you next year when we come back and we channel our energies in constructive ways and affecting our society where it matters and when it matters most, I have the passion to protect the forest, courtesy of my grandfather, who at the age of five nurtured the seed to befriend the nature. He did that because he would tell me, he would insist that you have to plant a tree. And that is the culture I made, that everything was symbolic and associated with marking sharp events with the planting of trees. For instance, if a child is born and the navel is to drop, the traditional thing is to plant a tree with that navel. And so there's a sense of attachment and ownership with that. So if we can go back and pick our children and begin the culture of tree planting, a way of life with the next generation, I think they'll be much more responsible in terms of stewardship towards the forest and responsibility. Let's, ladies and gentlemen, pursue action. That is the only thing that will bring us the change we hope to see. As I conclude, let me tell us a story, a story that borders on inaction. I tell my stories about associated with the forest animals and animals generally. That is how we were instructed. That is how we were able to learn as children. A farmer, together with the wife, were in the farmhouse. They had problems. Rats were creating problems in the house, so they had to go to the market. They bought a trap. They came back. When they came back, the rat saw it and was afraid. He ran out and met the chicken and told the chicken that please, it appears they brought something like it, something that is not very friendly into the house. The chicken just made the sound and ran away, said, well, Rat, that is your own cup of tea. We are not bothered with that. The rat left frustrated and met the good. It appears they have brought something inside that house I'm not very comfortable with that we need to pay attention to. The good man, man, that is, leave me, that is none of my business, and left. He now went to the cow and complained the same to the cow. The cow made moo. Oh, I really pity your situation. 
because they will really crush you to death. He went back to the house frustrated. That fateful night, the trap caught something. The farmer's wife moved to go and see. Behold, the trap caught a snake by the tail. And as she approached, the snake bit her. The following morning, she became ill and feverish, and she was taken to the hospital. As she was receiving attention, the first recommendation is that in order to bring down the fever, she needed to take something hot, some hot meal, something like what we call pepper soup. Guess the first choice in the preparation of pepper soup, it is the chicken. The chicken was used to prepare the pepper soup for the farmer's wife to recover. Incidentally, the, the fever became so intense and she needed to spend so much time in the hospital. And of course, that will attract visitors. Other sympathizers will come around and there was a need to entertain them, cook food for them, and they needed plenty meat. Guess the next thing to use in preparing the meal, the goat was used to prepare the meal. The fever never subsided and eventually, unfortunately, the woman died. The next issue, let's bury the woman. And many people will be invited to attend the funeral service. And we need plenty of meat to cook. And so the cow was used to prepare the meal to entertain everybody. So for them refusing, for being complacent, nonchalant about it, of course the rat sympathized with them, what had befallen them. But the chicken, the goat, and the cow, they paid dearly with our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, the threat from climate change is real. The result of inaction could be costly. The time to act is now. Thank you very much.